in some of the collections that I had, like I tend to collect these little bottles. I had so many and I decided to just keep nine of them. Um, and they appear in the paintings that there's one group of four and one group of five of these bottles. But I just sort of feel like when you, when you call and, and decide to just keep a few things, um, they become stronger in some way. They're not lost amidst the clutter. And so I think I really did learn that less is more in, in many, many cases. And, um, It just feels good to have fewer things that you can see or you can grasp. Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the KonMari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified KonMari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now, here's the show. Today, we're going to explore a unique KonMari journey that celebrates the ordinary in an extraordinary way. Our guest today is Jay Schlesinger. She is an award-winning artist from Ann Arbor, Michigan, who specializes in oil paintings of common objects and abstract paintings. She has previously worked as a medical illustrator, drawing professor, graphic artist, museum exhibit designer, and furniture maker, all of which are reflected in her art. Her recent solo exhibit, Possessed, caught our attention. It includes 380 individual paintings of all of her possessions in her own home, and it's inspired by minimalism and a simplified way of living. It sparks joy for Jay to explore the metaphorical possibilities of painting the mundane. She's going to give us a peek into the lifestyle change that inspired her creative process and story. Welcome Welcome to Spark Joy, Jay. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get started. So, Jay, do you remember the first moment you decided to explore mindfulness and minimalism and just a simplified way of living? And what really sparked that journey? Well, a number of things happened within a pretty short period of time, but I think the very first one may have been when I saw the movie called Tiny, which is a movie I'm sure you must know about it, about um, tiny houses and the tiny house movement. We'll link that in our show notes as well. Okay. Yeah. It was such a revelation and it really resonated with me. Um, I had never really heard anything about tiny houses and I was, I was just really taken by the whole idea. Um. And then that sort of reminded me of a, a flood that I had had in my basement a couple of years ago where I lost a lot of really important things that were very sentimental to me. And um, I had to get rid of them all. It was a, it was a sewage flood, so they were really ruined. <clears throat> and in the process of getting rid of these things, I took photographs um, just to have a record. And I realized shortly after that, that it wasn't nearly as devastating as I thought it was going to be in terms of just having to say goodbye to things that I thought were really important to have in my life. So, so that sort of feeling came back to me after I saw that movie and, and then all kinds of things happened to just add to that. Um, Coming across the minimalists podcast and then watching the movie minimalism and it just seemed like everywhere I went, I was, I was just eager to hear more about um, this whole movement. So as KonMari consultants, we encourage everyone that is executing the major tidying festival that we um, promote as the keystone of the KonMari um, philosophy to only surround themselves with things that spark joy. And your criteria for what objects remained in your home was that they either had to be especially useful or beautiful. Was Mm -hmm. it hard for you to stay within those parameters and while you were decluttering? Um, it wasn't really all that hard. Um, what was hard was that since I had this whole other element to the the project being the project was that, um, I was not only going to declutter and simplify, but I made a commitment to paint every single one of my possessions. So that just added a, another element to the whole idea of what's functional and what's beautiful. Um, because there were clearly things that 
that were functional that I had to keep and also clearly things that were beautiful. But there were in the end, there were things that I actually chose to keep because I wanted to paint them. <laughs> so um, that was sort of a, a little motivation to, to keep them because they were they just seemed like they'd be really fun things to paint. Um, but mostly it, it really wasn't hard. It was um, it. The hardest part was the fact that I'm married and my husband doesn't really share my um, aspirations. And so I had to divide my possessions into things that were clearly mine and things that were clearly my husband's. But then there was a whole category of things that were ours. And that was the that was a tricky category because he had to be on board if I wanted to really get rid of them. Um, that was that was probably the biggest challenge. Well, that whole strategy is actually really in line with the KonMari method where Marie Kondo suggests that we start by really examining things that we call our own um, or almost reclaiming them in a way um, and separating them at least in the beginning from from our spouse's things, especially if if our spouse is is taking uh, some time to come along uh, with the process. Uh Um, And so, yeah, it's a it's a great way to continue. So it sounds like that was really a beneficial technique for to move things along for you. And for the sake of this art project, I actually painted everything that was mine and everything that was ours. Ah. um, I didn't paint things that were clearly his, but I did include like our furniture and kitchen utensils and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. Very cool. (laughs) And how long did it take you to to finish um, the painting? I worked on this for about two years. Wow. Um, And there were, like you said, there were 380 original paintings but that doesn't mean that there were only 380 objects because a lot of the paintings had <clears throat> groups of objects or series mm-hmm. of objects mm-hmm. i see um, mm-hmm. and i also had paintings that had um boxes of things so in other words a box of files or a box of old letters and um so i didn't paint every single letter but it was very clear that i did a a pretty thorough accounting of everything that i decided to keep sure it's so interesting how you decided to do the painting while you were in the middle of your decluttering process. Um, you know, I guess I, I'm, I'm wondering how that happened. I mean, I guess I was thinking that that you had decided after finishing your tidy, oh, well, I think I'll paint, paint these things. But it sounds as though this was part of your plan all along. It was. It was actually, it coincided with the fact that we were moving. So um, in order to Uh, minimize our load since we actually downsized our living space. Um, So the the decluttering came kind of first in thinking about how to get rid of things to prepare for the move. But I was also looking for an art project. I had just finished a series of paintings and I was actually looking for some kind of more conceptual kind of art project. And um, it just came to me. It seemed like the perfect way to be really accountable to my desire to declutter, if I had to actually paint it, it was kind of like putting my money where my mouth was in a way and just being personally totally accountable to this plan to declutter. Um, And it gave my life this just wonderful structure for a period of time where I knew I had, I knew exactly what I was going to do every day in my studio. And, and I just really enjoyed the structure of that. Wow, that's so cool. Accountability through painting. I love this. <laughs> I know. It was, it was like, uh, that's sort of what kept me going. Because not, yeah. not only did I sort of promise myself I was going to see it through, but as I got into it, I told more and more people. Um, and then I really felt committed. Like, I told my friends, I'm going to paint everything I own. And it was kind of <laughs> yeah. hard to turn back after that. <laughs> well, I'm really interested in um, what the act of oil painting these objects told you about yourself and this experience, uh, the connection between the expression of this body of work and its reflection of, of you. Could you tell us a little bit more about mm-hmm. that? Um well, I'm, there's so many different levels to that. There's there's the level of what was it like to spend, you know, one to three days, say, um, on each painting. And that's a lot of hours to be reflecting on that specific thing that I was painting. So it gave me a chance to really connect with um, the meaning behind the objects in, in a lot of cases, especially the ones that were more sentimental, like um, 
my mother had passed away and I had some of her things that I was painting. And so during the process of spending hours and hours, you know, painting this particular bird or jar, I would think about my mother. Um, There's also a whole series of paintings of old photographs and that allowed me just this really reflective time and thinking about my ancestors, some of whom I had never even met. Um, So there was a real meditative quality to the act of painting these things that became so alive in the process. Um, And then I also had a chance to really think about, you know, why am I, why am I keeping these things? What do they mean to me as objects? Um, It was, it was a period of really deep reflection about stuff and, and my connection to these things and painting them. It just, like I said, it was such a meditative process because I had so many hours to really think about it as opposed to just picking something up and say, am I going to keep it or am I going to get rid of it and then putting it in a box? So it just was this prolonged period of, of real deep thinking. And the, the genre of, of still life painting is really, you know, one of the, probably one of the most, uh, the oldest forms of, of painting and, and it originated in the middle ages and it's still very popular today. Um, is that always been the, the method that you've chosen to express your art? Um, I think I've gone through a lot of different genres. Um, I keep coming back to still life painting because I do love painting objects, but I've done, uh, landscape and portraiture and a lot of illustration but there is something about the immediacy of, of having something in front of you and then translating it from th- three dimensions into two dimension. It's also very playful and there's just so many possibilities of, of um, different kinds of composition. And so it is, it is something that I keep coming back to. I think, I think it's deep in there somewhere, this desire to just depict an object well, you have such a, a distinct style and, and a lot of your work, especially in this particular um, group, is so distinctive. And it's, there's such a three-dimensional aspect to it. It's really very striking. Oh, thank you. I love how you have mentioned that you center your body of work around things that most would call mundane, things like paper bags or tools or food items. Can you tell us a little bit more about how these objects really inspire you and even though they're ordinary they inspire you in kind of extraordinary ways um i just feel like these things of everyday life connect us you know they're just so um they're so overlooked we take them for granted but i see that all around me that these really simple objects become a way that um a lot of people can find a way to connect with each other you know, I see that also when I exhibit my work and, and show these mundane objects. Everybody has a story about, you know, oh, I used to have one of those or my grandmother used to do this. Or it's I find it just to be these objects to be so universal. I guess I just it's kind of like rooting for the underdog or paying attention mm. to something that nobody else pays attention to. Very cool. That's so interesting because, in, and I think in our work as as consultants working with clients who are, you know, trying to make decisions about things, that, there are certain things that we run across probably consistently with every client. Um, and then, of course, there are so many things that seem very unique to people. And, and I think mm-hmm. it's always so amazing to to see what people choose to keep and what things feel really important to them. Right, right. And, and sometimes it is sometimes the most ordinary little objects that um, that are really meaningful and, and add a lot of joy to our lives, you know. I agree. Yeah. What do you know now after completing your latest project, which is called Possessed, that you didn't know before? Um, well, I think I sort of knew this, but now I'm more convinced that, um, that less is more. I think I really learned that um, in some of the collections that I had, like I tend to collect these little bottles. I had so many and, I decided to just keep nine of them Um, and they appear in the paintings that there's one group of four and one group of five of these bottles. But I just sort of feel like when you, when you call and, and decide to just keep a few things, um, they become stronger in some way. They're not lost amidst the clutter. And so I think I really did learn that less is more in, in many, many cases. 
And um, it just feels good to have fewer things that you can see or you can grasp. Wow, really curious. Post decluttering, did you notice any changes, or did your husband notice any changes in in your life, or just everyday experiences, or did you attract uh, something new into your space now that you had that revelation that less is more, and and you were open and created more space in your life? Um, I'm not so sure he really shared that. <laughs> He's, I think the most common refrain is, where's the so-and-so? <laughs> where's the cookie sheet? Where's the bread pan? <laughs> oh, we've all heard that so one. <laughs> I think in some ways, I, I went overboard, I think. And sort of anything that I felt was redundant, I got rid of. And now we're sort of, now that we're moved and we're digging through stuff, we're, we're realizing that I may have been a little ruthless. So um, <laughs> I don't know that... I don't, I don't know that he's, I, do, I honestly don't think he gets as much pleasure from, um, from the, the, the spareness or just the, the decluttered feeling as I do. But, um, I feel great. I just, I just love having fewer things. Um, it's not like I'm a most real minimalist though. I have to say that, um, it's more just for me it was always more about being deliberate than being minimal per se um so i i never really even thought of myself as a minimalist i just like the idea of of being really conscious and mindful and deliberate about these things rather than being minimal um because i do have a lot of things i saved a lot of decorative items and old toys and um probably it's a little bit more minimal when it comes to things like clothing and, and furniture but um I'm not, I don't think I'm a minimalist in the same way that a lot of true minimalists are. I just like to think of it as being, you know, thoughtful about, you know, what we choose to have around us. Well, well, that's really in alignment with Kunmari. And I'm curious, is there anything that you let go of that you had some second thoughts about or any regrets? Well, okay. One thing um, that I did, there, there were a number of things that I really agonized about and, um, most of them were sentimental, but I put them in a box and I put a big label on them called maybe. I was just unsure. I would definitely recommend that to people who are going through this, who are just plain agonizing about a particular item. I had a sweater that I was so, that had this long story associated with it. Um, I didn't need the sweater anymore, but I just loved what it represented. So I put it in the maybe box and um, I had about 20 things in the maybe box And at the end of a year, I went and I looked at it again, and I think I fished out maybe two things from the box. Um, But other than that, I don't really have any regrets for things that I had gotten rid of. Um, I did get rid of my my studio easel. I had a big oak painting easel, and I had been painting on a table and thought that I didn't need that anymore. So I gave it to a friend, and then just about a month ago, I was kind of wishing that I had had it. Um, but I just bought a new one. <laughs> <laughs> we, we always encourage mindful shopping. Yeah, in that yeah. case. And I bought it used off of a used website off of Craigslist. And so it's not like I, you know, I mean, I got, I took it off of somebody else's hands. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, Jay, it was so nice to meet the woman behind the paintings. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and so- we... We have a couple of more questions for you. That okay. We were just curious at this very moment, what sparks the most joy in your life? Well, besides my two grandchildren who spark a whole lot of joy, um, um, I think that one thing is that I've been building these little tables for my new um, house and um, they're sparking a lot of joy because they're, uh, I've just built three of them and they're just little end tables that fit a very specific spot. And I love the whole idea of creating um, functional furniture that, you know, for specific spaces so that you get exactly what you want. And those tables are sparking quite a lot of joy. 
Fantastic. And do you have any parting words of wisdom for our listeners? You have really explored possessions in such a unique, unique way. And I love how your paintings really honor uh, the things in your home, whether they are sentimental or just everyday objects. So do you have any words of wisdom to share based on your experience? Oh um, I guess I would just encourage people to find their own way through this whole process. Um, mine was definitely through painting. Um, but I think there's so many different ways to, to do it. And I think that I would just encourage people to do what feels right for them because there really isn't one right way for, mm. for everyone. Um, and a couple of my friends have told me that I've inspired them to, to do something similar and, and, and it's a slow process. And I think that, you know, no matter how you start, you know, I think it's, I think it's a good thing to do. I love that. Thank you so much, Jay. You can find out more about Jay by visiting jayslesinger.com. And that's J-A-Y-E-S-C-H-L-E-S-I-N-G-E-R.com. While you're there, please peruse her portfolio and you can contact Jay to purchase very beautiful, high-quality reproductions of her artwork in a variety of sizes. You can also check out her new project, Possessed, on our Instagram at Podcast. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning, tidying questions or share stories about how Kanmari has impacted your life. You can find us at sparkjoypodcast.com and click Ask Spark Joy to leave a question or comment for a chance to be featured on next week's show. While you're there, sign up to join our Spark Joy podcast community and get notified when each episode airs. You can also join the Spark Joy podcast community on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at the handle at Spark Joy Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope your day sparks joy. Thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your host, Kristen Ivey, of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago, and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast is not endorsed by or affiliated with Conmari Media Incorporated. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co-hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of Conmari Media Incorporated or the Conmari Consultant Community.